Welcome to AUKUS, folks. It's been a rocky ride to start the new month of trading after a couple of solid advances for the TSX in June and July, and even stronger performance over the last few months stateside. We saw some notable declines yesterday. We're seeing some of that selling pressure continue this morning. Many are pointing to that debt downgrade by Fitch, the U.S. losing its top-tier credit rating. Maybe, though, investors were looking for a reason to do a little bit of selling. Let's bring in John Goldsmith. He's head of Canadian equities at Montresco Bolton for a little bit more context. Nice to see you, sir. Thanks for having me. What do you think is driving the mood of the markets right now? Um, so I, I think it's kind of inevitable that uh, we were going to uh, get the, that fish downgrade. Um, I believe uh, one or two of the other rating agencies had already downgraded U.S. debt a couple of years ago. Uh, so Fitch was a little bit late from that perspective. But, you know, when you take a look at um, the ballooning deficits, interest rates that are higher, the cost of financing, the short-term debt that comes due, um, it just kind of points to a big red hole at the bottom of the uh, U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve uh, balance sheet. So, um, yeah, it kind of is um, almost an afterthought, the fact that uh, they actually had to cut. And it's not a huge cut going from AAA to AA plus, so yeah. it could be worse situations. Yeah, the, well, Fitch itself has found itself on the defense very quickly. They were talking to our Bloomberg colleagues yesterday, and they said, hey, look, the U.S. still has a pretty good credit right. rating out there. But you know what's interesting to me about this story is that when we were seeing that debt ceiling standoff in Washington, it made a lot of headlines, but the market was sort of shrugging it off to a certain degree. The market seemed more obsessed with where the economy was going, what the interest rate picture was like and here we are over the last month with economic data that's generally shown resiliency you've got messages from jay powell himself saying he's his economics team no longer sees a, a recession for the u.s economy bank of america said as much yesterday so fitch is sort of flagging some of the squabbling in washington as having consequences and the market is reacting to that i just i think it's surprising that they weren't reacting as much when the actual squabbling was taking place so you bring up really good points so with regards to the first one and the debt ceiling standoff i think it was just a question of using that as political capital at the time to barter a better deal for Republicans, for lack of a better word. But the reality of actually going to um, a debt break, that the likelihood of that was literally, you know, infinitesimally small. Whereas this was a bit of a curveball, it was unexpected. But at the same time, too, in terms of balancing out the pros and the cons, the U.S. economy doing better, all these things are true. But if you take a look at the staggering amount of debt that the U.S. has added to their balance sheet, like since COVID, we're talking, you know, close to $10 billion. And, you know, you don't need to be a math whiz to figure out if you increase your interest expense by 1% or 2% off of that incremental $10 billion, you need to raise taxes. You need to raise revenues in some other way. But if you take a look at the Inflation Reduction Act last year, that's very pro-stimulus. And pro-stimulus means you're going to spend a lot of money. You're not getting revenues coming in. So yeah. I think it's just a question of, like, reflecting reality. And the reality is also on a relative basis – the currencies of Europe, of China, aren't necessarily any better. They're not facing any better problems. China just came out of a, you know, uh, COVID November of last year, two years later than everyone else, right? Right. Yeah, it's like, um, you know, if you've got your variable rate mortgage, now you need not one, but maybe five lemonade stands outside the house to yes. generate a little bit more revenue to Correct. offset that. Um, I do want to talk about the reality of what's happening in the bond market as well. This morning, people might hear you've got rising treasury yields, and then that puts some pressure on equities as well. Can, can you explain that dynamic to our audience? Sure. So uh, essentially, what investors are trying to look for is that, to call it proverbial free lunch. So if you can get a higher return on your bonds, which are considered historically to be risk-free. And when we're talking about this, we're usually talking about government-related bonds, not corporate bonds, but it has a, a knock-on effect as well. If the yields are higher, then it just means that um, it's more attractive to go to the bond market because you'll be taking on less risk than you would normally for equity market. And if you look at historical equity market returns in Canada, they've been around 7%, in the U.S. around 8 or 9%. So... A higher bond yield just means that you will potentially have investors, especially after the fact that the S&P 5 is, you know, call it new all-time highs with regards to price performance, that money is going to be probably looking to take some money off of the table and redeploy it into something that's, been, that's a little bit safer. So that there's an inverse correlation between the two. We, I, I, I would not blame our audience for feeling like they get 
whiplash because quite literally coming into this month, because you saw that stock market momentum, it did feel like people were saying it is paying to be in the equity market, even though there are these attractive yields elsewhere. And actually, if you're not in the stock market right now, you might not be able to match the returns of the broader market by being in cash or being in some of those other products. And here we are all of a sudden overnight, the conversation's starting to change a little bit. I mean, what's the conversation you're having about where to be going forward? So first is framing the strength of the stock market year to date. The strength of the stock market in the U.S. in particular yeah, and is a bit of an anomaly yeah. because it is highly concentrated in six or seven names. And if you strip out the price performance of the AI-related names, including NVIDIA, and you've got your you know, uh, Alphabet and Microsoft and Facebook, yada, 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 Meta, um, you've got a very low single-digit return that's actually very similar to what you have in Canada. And it's the same thing if you strip out the performance of the tech names you have a price performance that's maybe two to 3%, which is not all that great, and it's probably underperforming what long-term bonds have done. Mm. So I think the question now is, is there further gas in the AI narrative for leadership and technology to keep on spurring the equity markets further, or are we kind of at a point where, you know, they've really done great, now it's time to recycle some money, and I think the timing of that Fitch announcement, yeah, it just, it's, I don't say it's well-timed, but you're kind of petering out on the AI momentum. It's at a time when people are starting to ask more questions. Bingo. We'll watch Apple and Amazon with results after the bell tonight. Final question. Uh, in this environment, you wonder what happens. Do people go back to the U.S. dollar for some safety? And then if we're talking about currency, you have to correlate with things like gold, which not too long ago was above $2,000 an ounce. I think its performance ultimately impacts to a certain degree the TSX Materials Group. What are you going to be watching there? So... Gold has a very strong negative correlation to the U.S. dollar. So what it means is if the U.S. dollar goes up, gold goes down and vice versa. And if you look at over the last 10 years, the price percentage correlation is around negative 0.7, but the value is about negative 0.9. So it's almost a perfectly uh, one for one. U.S. dollar was extremely strong in October of last year, partly on the backs of the U.K., quasi self-imploding, Europe having monstrous inflation problems, and China being in lockdown. U.S. dollar hit a peak of, peak of around 115, the trade weight of U.S. dollar, otherwise known as the DXY. We're now 102, but it wasn't too long ago the U.S. dollar was around 80. And all I'm saying is that if all these other economies start to perform, and U.S. now just has got their debt downgraded, and they're going to have a large amounts of interest that they're going to end up having to pay, it's, it's not out of realm or out of reason to think that the U.S. dollar, trade weight U.S. dollar is likely going to decrease. Mm. And one of the prime beneficiaries of that happening is gold moving up. So as a result of that, you know, we have our positions and our favorite way to play gold is via the royalty companies. We feel you get the best bang for the buck. Lower downside, you get to participate in all the upside. So for people looking for large cap names, there's Franco Nevada. For small cap names, there's Cisco Royalties. And both of those names, they have royalties, so probably call it 60% more exploration royalties, so you have a lot of optionality, but more importantly, from a geographic perspective, primarily in the Americas, so you're not taking on a lot of geographic risk, and that's the way to play the weakening of the U.S. dollar at best. Okay. Well